I have met a lot of veterans. I perhaps we all have. I was lucky and some of them shared part of their story with me. There was a man who landed at Gallipoli in the afternoon of the 25th of April, who then served in France and then joined up for World War II. He was captured by the Japanese at the fall of Singapore. There was a flight sergeant who maintained radar sites in North Queensland. A woman who was an air plotter and later married that man. Another woman who was a firefighter in the Blitz. I once met a Polish Spitfire pilot who married a survivor from Belson. But today I'm going to talk about a sailor in the Royal Navy. Dennis was born in Tottenham in the UK in July of 1924 to his mum and dad, Bert and Lillian. They had been married the previous year in January and they were both they had both served in World War One. Lillian as a nurse in the Alexandria Nursing Service and Bert served with the Royal Horse Artillery on the Western Front. As the Depression eased, Dennis's brother, Alan, was born in 1933 with turned ankles. He was profoundly crippled. Dennis had found himself neglected as his mother focused on getting Alan on his feet and walking. This was a horrendous task and involved Lillian twisting her young son's feet and clamping them in irons. Not an easy task, but a war experience had made her a tough, loving mother, but not always a close one. The clouds of war were becoming obvious, even to a young lad who was into roller skating, swimming in the River Lee, playing soccer on icy fields. He listened to his father's tales of the Western Front and thought if he was destined to go to war, then the army was not his first choice. He started to badger his parents into joining the Royal Navy as an apprentice. His father had been keen on getting him to get a trade, but he wanted him in the mines. Dennis, on the other hand, wanted to go to sea. He liked the athletic lifestyle he saw of a sailor, and in those days, young sailors still climbed the rigging, sailed whalers, and played sport at least twice a week. In between these activities, these young men learnt their engineering trade. Finally, in late 1938, with the help of an aunt who signed him up in the Royal Navy, he faked his age so he could start in the new year at the Royal Navy's training school, HMS Ganges, in Shotley. The old Ganges mask was used for both ceremonial and training. All the boys were required to climb the mast to the half-moon platform at the top gallant. Above this point, the mast could be climbed, but the boy was free to refuse. Den learnt a lot. Petty Officer Dusty Miller had a simple but straightforward way of teaching. Like many, he taught from personal experience and in such a way that the young men listened and learnt. Dusty had served in World War I and his lessons were often backed up with practical exercises that hit the mark. Particularly useful to Den was Dusty's survival at sea lessons, which were based on his own experience and were to prove vital to many young men in the years to come. Den loved his days at Ganges and he relished the exercises, whether swimming, diving, climbing the mast or realistic exercises such as launching the whaler for man overboard drills, but it was to be the start of his naval service, and that was to mark Den for life. In late 1939, the Navy posted its young apprentices out to firms to continue the engineering side of their training. The great influx of reservists had made it impossible to train the apprentices in their normal establishments. Den was sent to H.D. Murray engineering works, learning how to use lathes and other tools, as well as continuing his naval training. In the local town hall. In April of 1941, he was posted to sea and joined his first ship as an engineering artisan apprentice. HMS Vicious was an ex-Belgium cross-channel steamer converted to an anti-submarine auxiliary. It wasn't Den's first posting. In the emergency of Dunkirk, when the British Army were taken off the beaches and the harbour piers in front of an advancing German army, the British sent scores of civilian manned vessels to the area. The little ships of Dunkirk, as they're often called, were manned by volunteer crews. 
In many cases, a naval rating or a midshipman was put on board these ships to give the status of a naval crew if they were captured. So Dennis was sent to the Tug Corona before his 16th birthday and was helping in the Great Armada as it rescued the British Army. It's hard to imagine the presence of naval ratings with very little experience would have been important to this tug. I doubt he offered any serious leadership to the crew, but he did represent the Royal Navy and as such gave the still crew the status equivalent to servicemen. That status may have meant the difference between life and death had the ship been sunk or the crew captured. The Navy had a long history of putting young men in serious positions. One of Den's heroes was the boy Cornwall, who on the 15, well, at the age of 15 won the VC at the Battle of Jutland. So in May of 1940, Den went to war, partly trained but very aware of the traditions of the Royal Navy. In those days off Dunkirk, his tug towed lifeboats full of soldiers to ships offshore. He helped young men not much older than himself over the side of the corona, and these men were close to exhaustion, worn down by defeat and the retreat. But he learnt that even a 16-year-old boy can make a difference. That tug was off Dunkirk for five days, and when she returned to Dover, Dan was simply landed and sent back to Hackney Town Hall to finish his trade training, such as it was. In training at Murray's continued through the Blitz, he learned a lot about lathe and milling machines, and on the, week, and on the weekend he completed his naval training. In April, he joined the ship after an accelerated program, whether he was ready or not. Vicious was part of an escort group by the destroyer Voracious. Occasionally, Vicious crossed the Atlantic but did not have the range without embarking extra coal. She did at least one trip to the US, but in the main, she operated as an escort and rescue ship. In March of 1942, she was escorting a convoy into Liverpool. She had a complement of 93 officers and men and was carrying about 95 survivors from other ships. As an ex-cross-channel ferry, she had plenty of spare accommodation and was perfect for a rescue ship. A tanker had hit a mine and Vicious was ordered to close to pick up survivors. But as she steamed towards it, she also hit a mine and began to take water. A few months earlier, Dennis had been shifted from the engineering branch to the seaman branch. And it was that night he was standing by to assist survivors. Over the next 20 minutes, he quietly went about his duties in, as instructed, and that was to set the depth charges to safe and then ditch the confidential books in weighted bags. He remembered being quite calm as he went about the job and even went back to the petty officer and asked him whether anything else needed doing, to which the petty officer replied, not much, mate, and he then noticed the water was lapping his feet. He always said he didn't really abandon the ship, it more or less abandoned him. He entered the water somewhere around five o'clock at night. Fortunately, it was re he was reasonably well-dressed and had been trained well. The water was bitterly cold, but then remembered to curl up and to minimise heat loss and not turning it on his lifeboat belt light until it was he thought there was someone around because it had a very limited battery life. As he floated in the water, he was slowly coated in black oil from the tanker's cargo. That oil probably saved his life and kept him warm, but it also damaged his stomach lining and for many years he needed special treatment just to keep food down and his digestive system working. It is hard to tell how long he floated in the water because he could not see his watch, but it must have been several hours. The destroyer Voracious had dropped a whaler in the water and the men rowed four miles into the minefield to rescue anyone found alive. 
When the ship sank, the survivors held on board were given the lifeboats and the sailors of the Royal Navy took their chance in the water. Dem was one of uh, the last found that night and he was probably drifting off when he heard something that made him turn on his light and the crew in the whaler found him. And they dragged him over the side and a sailor wrapped him and himself in a blanket to give him warmth. It was reported that Dem was barely alive when they reached the destroyer. However, he did survive and was transferred to the Royal Naval Hospital at Hasler in Liverpool to recover before he was sent on survivor's leave. In the water, he remembered the reoccurring thought that he was going to, he was going to die and that the only thing he felt was unfair was he'd yet to lay with a woman. Survivor's leave was only seven days, but in Den's case, it was he was to be recategorised as a seaman before joining his next posting. The only noticeable thing he remembered from that survivor's leave was meeting a woman in an air raid shelter, and within 14 months, they would be married. After training as a signalman, Den joined his new ship, the Northern Gem. She was a trawler and her home port was Liverpool. The Northern Gem was about to sail for Iceland as he walked across the gangway. He was joining as the second signalman, which meant she was sailing on a large operation where they would need to maintain communications with other ships 24 hours a day. Trawlers normally carried a fairly small crew, but as the war progressed and new equipment and new demands were made of the ships, the crews grew in size. When Northern Gem sailed with other trawlers to Reykjavik to await the convoy to form up and then sailed to Russia, she was carrying about 28 people. PQ-17 was to be the first summer convoy to Russia. It was, that was, it was going to have 24 hours of daylight and this meant the ships could be attacked by aircraft or by submarine or by surface craft all the way there. With PQ-17, there would be no respite. The convoy was to be 34 ships and to be escorted by a very powerful force of destroyers and trawlers with a covering force of cruisers and battleships. If it had been run properly, the convoy had a chance to be remembered as a valiant fight like the run to Malta. But instead, it was to have a, be a poor show for many of the Royal Navy ships. The Northern Gem was not to share their shame because she stayed with the merchant ships the whole trip. Not by, much by choice, but her speed meant she could do little else. That was all in the future. Den settled into his new ship and got to know some of the crew. It was funny and unusual and an unsettling time, because unlike most of his crew, he had been sunk and had lost a lot of mates already. The gem had been a lucky ship, and had not lost anyone since the Normanway campaign early in 1940. It was shortly before the, his 18th birthday, and he was now the youngest among the ship's company. But he had served in a more bitter war than most of them. War makes people grow up quickly. He was still a teenager. He had met a girl, but sex was still a fantasy. And yet he was probably wiser and mentally tougher than men in their 30s today. Dennis found that he was a very competent signalman and quickly became a key member of the bridge crew. The Northern Gem had a very good commander who knew how to get the most of his men. The coxswain is equally a good solid solar, sailor and a leader of men. Unlike some in the Vichurst, these were tough men that recognised that Dennis was while still a boy in many ways, had a lot to offer. I guess Dennis needed the gem as much as she needed him, and so Russia was to be a challenge, but it helped make Dennis the man he was to become. The convoy sailed on the 27th of June, 1942, and for the first four days they had little action, but then the German aircraft found them on the 2nd of July. Incidentally, that was his birthday. The first attack developed. But aircraft or submarines were not the reason PQ-17 became famous. While these machines did eventually take the toll on the convoy, it was the fear of the battleship Tirpitz 
that caused the convoy to be scattered and the escorts to stay with the merchant ship or charge off in the direction of the battleship. But the battleship wasn't at sea. Faulty intelligence was and trying to manage the war from London, a London bunker instead entrusted to the bridge of, the, of one of the escorts resulted in this convoy breaking up and making an independent trip to Russia. Of the 34 escorted merchantmen in the convoy, only 11 were to make it to Archangel. The convoy had nowhere to scatter, as you can see from this map. They blocked their way to the north, the Germans controlled the sea to the south, so there was nowhere that the ships could go other than, than straight towards Russia, and therefore they could not avoid enemy air attack. There was little point in splitting up the convoy. One trawler, the air shower, took three ships into the ice and painted one side white to avoid the slaughter. The rest either succumbed to enemy action or by some miracle got to a place called Nova Zema where they were able to shelter from the onslaught between the islands. The ships self sheltered between the two islands until there was enough of them together. When they had formed up about nine ships and the uh, escorts around them. They culled the escorts and then they started to fight their way across the White Sea. This last photo shows the deck of an anti-aircraft ship, HMS Pozarica, after the fight across the White Sea. The ships would remain in Archangel until September when QP-14 sailed them home to Britain. After PQ-17, Dennis posted to Dover. And this was a relatively good posting for him because it was close to London. However, they were in the range of the German coastal batteries, often under air attack, and his job was to minesweep the waters between Ramsgate and New Haven which is, as the map indicates, was the Dover area. It was known as a hellfire corner because of the coastal batteries, the closeness of the German airfields and e-boats that operated in the shallow waters. Dover was a naval base throughout the war, but it was a home for trawlers, drifters and motor torpedo boats. Larger ships, like destroyers, had left the base early in 1940. One remained, the Covington, she was sunk alongside, a victim of an air raid. Dennis had moved to the patrol service, which was originally made up of fishing men and other crews, but as the war progressed, the mine sweeping task required more men than just those who originally came with the trawlers. He often, it was often viewed as a punishment draft but he still had very fond memories of the men he served with in the small ships. Dennis served on several ships, initially as a relief crew on the Lois, then the Clyde Ness, but eventually he was posted to a drifter called the Reverberation, and this was his permanent draft. She displaced 86 tonnes and was armed with a 12-pounder cannon forward, two twin Lewis machine guns on the bridge wings, and a 20 millimeter cannon aft. And she did look a bit like a European drifter working the herring banks on the coast of France. And for this reason, she was occasionally used in, by what they called the inshore squadron, which as the name suggests, worked close inshore on the French coast. A couple of stories to give you some feel of what the ships did from time to time. They would slip up the coast of France to pick up personnel from the beach. These could be agents being returned to UK or occasionally, as happened once, Dennis picked up refugees from a concentration camp. That night, Dennis was in charge of a small boat when it came into the French coast to pick up some people. It was mid-1943 and most people in UK had no idea about what was happening to the Jews of Europe. 
There were some who were aware of the Nazi program to move Jews to ghettos, but the enormity of the crime occurring in Europe was still beyond most outside of the intelligence services and the occasional servicemen like Den who came across the victims. On this night, he stepped onto French soil. It wasn't the first time, but this time he met a French resistance member on the beach and they guided him to some people. He looked in the dark, he couldn't see much of them, but he sensed one of them was a girl, and he took her hand and guided her back to the boat, I guess like any gentleman. They came alongside, and as they did, the little girl, or the girl, gave him a little horseshoe, perhaps a charm from a charm bracelet. She could not speak very much English, but he got the impression she wanted him to have this. It was the last gift to the man who finally took her away from that evil empire where she had lived. He didn't know the backstory, but it was aware that it was painfully, she was painfully thin and she was Jewish. If he didn't know before, he knew what he was fighting for now. Most of the time, the reverberation was employed in laying dam boys to mark the channel after the sweepers had cleared it. In a mine sweeping flotilla, there was normally four sweepers and two drifters. And depending on the type of mine they were sweeping for, that they were moored, magnetic, acoustic, or even a pressure mine that was triggered by the change of pressure as the ship moved over the mine. The sweepers would sweep the channel, sometimes multiple times, and the dam layers would mark the channel so that the ship's following could stay in a swept channel. Convoys came through the Dover area when they were en route from the Welsh coal mines to the city of London, mainly carrying coal, the lifeblood of the power stations of London. <clears throat> when they came through, the minesweepers and drifters would form an escort, taking station on the French side of the convoy, often laying smoke to prevent coastal guns being able to see their targets or the fall of shot. It was always the ambition of the German commanders to block the narrow channel between the Goodwin Sands. They tried several times, but they never succeeded. However, this work was dangerous because not only were the mines a potential threat to the trawlers, the trawlers were also subjected to shelling, air and e-boat attack. Fast flying fighter planes could attack quickly and leave a trawler dead in the water with a bomb in its engine room or in the, as in the case with the waterfly, blown up and sunk with all its crew. Den said he did not expect to live because he had seen too much death around him to believe that he was immune from the sting. In late, in late 1943, the reverberation was laying down, boys, when two FW-190 fighter aircraft attacked the minesweeping group. Den was on the starboard side of the bridge watching the flotilla leader as it was his job to relay any signals from the leader to his captain. When the fighter planes were seen to be heading towards the ship, he also manned a starboard Lewis gun. His mate, Mac, took the port gun. The fighter banked around and came in on the port side. Den heard Mac engage the aircraft with his gun. Then he felt a kick in the back and he collapsed to his knees and must have lost consciousness for perhaps a second or two. When he came to, the bridge was covered in blood. His skipper was knocked unconscious and bleeding. The water tank was leading, leaking, but Den could, pull him, could just pull himself up to his feet and look around. Mac was dead, hanging in the straps of his gun. Elsewhere, men were stand, attending to the wounded on the deck, so Dennis took control of the ship and steered her towards the flotilla leader. As the reports came in, he was able to ascertain that both the captain and the first officer were injured, and at least one other sailor, a stoker, had been killed. Den reported to the flotilla leader the facts, and then was ordered to take the ship to Dover and land the injured and the dead. So Den, barely 19, steered the ship into Dover Harbour and brought her alongside, but not without incident. When they were at sea, the lifeboats were slung out for immediate launch. However, Dennis forgot 
and on going alongside, the boat was smashed against the wall. It was, only, it was then after the ship secured that Dan realised the kick in his back had actually been a shell fragment that had gone through the water tank and smacked into his back and lodged beneath his spine. Den was injured and landed to the local hospital. When he left hospital, he was able to attend Mac's funeral in the local churchyard, and he found out he was to be court-martialed for not pulling the boat along outside. While it was only a formality and nobody <laughs> believed him guilty of any serious crime, he was reprimanded, and as he said, as they said, they put on his record, first command, reprimand. Within a few days, the ship was repaired, a new commanding officer joined, as the previous one had more serious injuries, and ver reverberation went back to sea. Since I could tell you about, but this is a short talk. Eventually the war came to an end, and Dennis was allowed to complete his apprenticeship, and eventually awarded a fitter and turner certificate. In later life, he suffered what would be called post-traumatic stress disorder, but he didn't think of it that way. He thought of it as he needed to get some help because he'd hit a woman he loved. It was a long story, and it related to a specific traumatic event during the war. But he was lucky in one respect. He met a psychologist who was able to coax out of Dennis the story that Dennis had buried and was now able to see it in context. He made a complete recovery and never lost his temper or his understanding of where he was, and hence never struck his wife or children ever again. When I spoke to him nearly 20 years ago, he said he never expected to survive and hence when he was married in 1943, he wasn't sure he loved his wife. That was until his daughter was born in 1945, just a few weeks before the end of the war in Europe. Perhaps it's too hard, he was too hard on himself, but he was expressing himself honestly. When I asked him how did he muster the courage to keep going back to sea, he looked at me and said, I was 18, it was my life. What else could I do? Den lived till, 19, till 2007 and died at the age of 83. At his funeral, and I delivered his eulogy, I closed with Dennis was a teenage warrior. A survive, he survived five years of war. He married at 19, had his first child at 21, and then his life really started. He was my hero. He was my father. <laughs>